Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the fourth annual CIM lecture at the University of Wolverhampton. My name is Sarah Williams, and I'm the Associate Director of the Business School here at Wolverhampton University, and I will be hosting you this evening for our lecture with Deborah Darlington. Uh, before we get going this evening, can I remind you of some housekeeping? Um, this is a public platform, so please don't share any private information in the, sh in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, the lecture is being recorded, as you can probably see, and um, we will be uh, taking any questions at the end. So if you have any questions for Deborah, could I ask that you pop them into either the chat or the Q&A, and we will pick those up at the end of the session. Um, we are very proud to be uh, hosting this CIM Midlands lecture again this year. We've been partnering with CIM to offer qualifications for many years now, and we now offer uh, four awards alongside CIM um, and deliver their awards for them, including the, the level four professional certificate in marketing and digital, digital marketing, and also their level six qualifications in um, marketing and digital marketing. My own relationship with CIM spans uh, at least a couple of decades and I've been working with them now as a senior examiner for almost 10 years. Um, so it's, it's a very long relationship which we are proud to have. CIM not only provides in crucial thought leadership, support and industry data for marketers, um, but it also offers excellent qualifications and training, mm -hmm. which is respected the world over. Um, we are delighted to be part of that and we are delighted that um, our relationship with the CIM means that we have accredited our own awards with them as well. As we move into a post-pandemic, post-Brexit world, marketing has become more important than ever. Um, we need to develop and maintain our relationships with our stakeholders. We need to connect with audiences and, and to develop those relationships um, to make our, uh, our offer much stronger. Um, and we want our students to, to benefit from that. We want our students to, to get the work that, that they need in marketing, and we want them to be equipped with the skills that they need to be successful marketers. Um, we have developed and embedded uh, four pillars in our programme. The four pillars that we operate here at the university are sustainability, responsibility, digital and innovation and enterprise. And these four pillars we think are absolutely crucial to uh, businesses as, as we move forward into an uncertain future. We have embedded those pillars throughout all of our courses here and we are delighted that in partnership with the Charter Institute of Marketing we have been able to have those courses recognised. We believe that students should be agile and flexible thinkers and I'm sure that you will agree this evening from, from our speaker that, that agility and flexibility is something that all marketers need to have. Um, we are proud this evening to, to bring to you um, with the CIM Midlands, the annual lecture with Deborah Darlington. And um, we are uh, lucky to have with us today two members of CI, uh, CIM Midlands who will be able to, to talk you through what they do in the Midlands and, and the role of the professional body. Um, and we would like to thank very much uh, Rachel Mabe, who is the chair of CIM Midlands Regional Board and Amy Sandu, who is the uh, vice chair for education. Um, thank you both indeed for your support and thank you both for joining us here this evening. Um, without any further ado, I will now introduce you to Rachel and, uh, and hand over to Rachel and Abby, um, who will take us, Amy, sorry, who will take us through CIM Midlands. Hello. Can everyone hear me okay? I hope so. Um, thank you for such a warm introduction, Sarah, and we are so pleased um, to be with you this evening. Um, and um, I'm going to start off and then I'm going to pass the baton over to Amy to, to talk um, a, a bit more about um, education um, and her role with CIM here in the Midlands. Um, so I think Sarah's given me such a great introduction to the CIM. You've saved me. You've saved me half my job this evening. So thank you so much. Um, you should, you know, obviously Wolverhampton is one of the, the, our kind of really important partners in the Midlands. And 
it was one of the last face-to-face -face events I came to actually before, I dread to mention the pandemic so early on, um, but it was one of the last events that I attended in person. And it was such a lovely um, and vibrant event with such a really, what really struck me was the, the kind of, the real kind of range of people in the audience kind of listening to, I think it was Dave Chaffee talking about marketing. Um, so we're so delighted to partner with you again and to support this event this evening. Um, and I think that, that CIM, you know, you, you hopefully all do know that it's the largest organisation in the world for professional marketers. The reason I've become so involved with CIM is really because of the personal kind of um, impact it's had on my journey. And I think that's always really nice to, to kind of tell people, you know, when I was a student, I didn't like public speaking, I would have avoided it at all costs, and I've ended up going into lecturing. And I think part of that has been the confidence that CIM has kind of given me. And, um, and I started out teaching CIM qualifications and um, and then I've gone on to, to, to suddenly in September, I started a new role teaching at the university I studied at, which is a very surreal feeling indeed. Um, but if I tell you a little bit about the CIM in the Midlands, because I think most people are aware that CIM operates nationally, but they do have volunteer networks and networks across the regions. And I'm very proud that CIM in the Midlands, we're the second largest region of the UK. Um, and if we can move to the next slide, I've put a little map on there and, and uh, to, to kind of show you where we stretch from. Now you might be thinking my geography is slightly off here because um, I put Stafford in the north, but really the most important thing is Wolverhampton, I think is the most westerly point of our region and um, the most important kind of part on that side of the map. Um, and, um, and we do cover the whole spectrum and we have 3000 CIM members in the Midlands and that's at a range of different levels. So some are studying and have the ACIM, we have members, MCIM, we have fellows and chartered marketers. And I think the reason CIM, I think, was so important to me is because it kind of gave me that journey. I think university gave me that kind of warm, fuzzy feeling and I felt very supported. And then I started my career and I really felt that CIM kind of offered me this kind of pathway suddenly of progression. And um, But very often I would find myself thinking, but that event's in London, that event's somewhere that I can't access. So the, the CIM were really keen to kind of have regional boards whereby at a local level here in the region, that we can put on events when it's safe to do so. And hopefully in 2022, we might actually, dare I say, put some face-to-face -face events on again. There's CPD opportunities. We've got a great webinar express series and we've got um, a few to share with you this evening. Um, opportunities for career development, student support and networking and mentoring opportunities. Um, and, um, and that's all at a kind of Midlands level. We'd really love to hear from people as well. You know, we've, we've had a couple of years for obvious reasons where we've not been able to do quite what we've wanted to do, um, but we really need to kind of hear from members in the Midlands and, and really take direction from them in terms of what they'd like to see happening um, and really create a strong and vibrant network of marketers um, here in the Midlands to support the great work of, of universities. Um, like Wolverhampton. So thank you so much for having us this evening. I'm so excited to listen to Deborah and, um, and all about um, her career and, and, and the work she's doing. I'm going to pass on now to my colleague, Ami, who's going to tell you a little bit more about CIM Midlands, if that's all right. Good evening, everybody. So yeah, I'd just like to echo what Rachel said. We're very much um, excited to be partnering with Wolverhampton again um, and being with, here, with you guys here today. Um, if we could just move to the next slide. Wonderful. Um, so the reason why we've uh, kind of, we don't obviously want to give you um, a whole lowdown about the different kind of competencies, but the reason we've put them on here is just to talk you through. So um, myself as well, I started with CIM as a member at university. Um, and I have to say that it's been uh, one of the most uh, positive things that I've done after leaving university as well. So it's always been there as my kind of professional career as a bit of a shadow arm that I can always kind of fall back on. Um, and the key things about these kind of competencies is that when um, you're at university, you don't always kind of think that they're going to be as relevant when you're kind of released into the big wide world, as we might want to put it. Um, but one of the key things for me that I'd like to share as a bit of a golden nugget for you guys is that I wish when I was at university, someone had kind of given me these tips um, to actually kind of look at these different uh, competencies and how you could actually um, look at your experience and how you could go about, um, you know, trying to meet these competencies. So um, for me, myself, when I've gone out to the um, different interviews, they've actually kind of asked for competencies and how you meet them. 
Um, so yeah, so what you might want to do is just kind of have these in the back of your mind while going through university. Look at the opportunities that come your way. Um, you know, so stuff like influencing. Try to think about how you kind of meet those, um, and then you know throughout your kind of uh, your, your journey at university, you could kind of look at how you could put down what you've done. So you might you know champion something. You might set up a club. You might look at you know extra activities that you've done outside of university that meets those competencies. And then when you are going for interviews. Already you're up, you've got that kind of slightly competitive edge um, where you can actually say, this is what I've done and how I've done that. Um, next slide. Um, and then, yeah, just as I touched on, we, we just wanted to kind of um, touch on the different things that we wish that we were told when we were at university. Um, and I think one of the key ones is probably stay on top of your learning. So as much as we're very, you know, kind of studying and staying on top of the different kind of reading um, elements that we're given. The key thing is to try and keep that going and that momentum with you as you kind of, you know, head out of um, graduation and start to look at where you want your degree to go. Um, and also, I think one of the key things for me is never be afraid of asking for help. So I think for myself, I was sometimes always conscious of, you know, how I came across or what I needed or where we, what I wanted to specialise in. So marketing is quite, you know, um, it has so many avenues to actually specialise in. Um, and, you know, raise your hand and you're quite lucky at Wolverhampton, you've got so much um, resources available to you. So always try and keep that in the back of your mind um, and keep a record of your kind of learning. So something that I started doing as soon as I left in my first kind of job uh, was to actually kind of just put, even if it's a boring Excel or a PowerPoint, just to kind of list the different courses and the reading that you're um, doing at the end of the year, um, just a bit like your kind of CPD at work, you might actually have like a performance review or just like an annual chat with your manager. And it looks really good um, to say that you've done all these different things. And that's where CIM can come in as well. So you can actually be kind of volunteering for um, CIM as while you're at university. So it gives you that little bit more of an experience space um, as you leave in. Um, and then so all the opportunities that come your way. So volunteer, look at organisations that you might want to work for and see if they've actually got anything um, over the summer, any kind of voluntary work for a week. Again, it just gives you that kind of insight into the big wide world before you leave. Um, and then connect with people in the field. So um, myself and Rachel are on LinkedIn. You're, we're more than happy for you to connect with us um, and see what kind of different things you can get involved in on the board we're very much you know even happy if one of you guys want to volunteer to look after our digital channels for the day um, and we're very much about championing students um, and you know how we can support that um, and the next slide should actually have our kind of details on so there's all sorts of different things you can get involved with um, in terms of CIM and we've listed a couple of the upcoming webinars that are open to you guys as well to get involved in and our details um, of how you can get involved with CIM meetings specifically. Um, so the board has a wide range of different people from all sorts of different sectors. So yes, after this um, session, please do connect with us um, and we'd be, you know, we'd be uh, really grateful to kind of hear from you. And if there's anything we can support you with, me and Rachel are more than happy to do that. Passing back to yourself, Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amy, and, and also thank you um, for your fantastic advice to our students. I, I think uh, <laughs> it's always useful to get advice from professionals and people working in the field. Um, so please do um, keep in touch with um, Amy and, and Rachel if you want any information about CIM Midlands. They are a very active community, as you've just seen, and, um, and well worth um, keeping in touch with. Okay, so our speaker this evening is Deborah Darlington. She is Director of Brand, Marketing and Communications at the Cooperative Bank PLC. Deborah is a passionate marketer. She's worked across a number of amazing brands, facing a whole host of different challenges, which we will learn about this evening. She's led businesses through the tradition, transition from more traditional marketing to digital, and she's revived, revitalized struggling brands, taking them from um, to new audiences through the power of informed insight. Uh, she has a breath of business management experience and project delivery across retail, mail order, financial services, um, and, and, a, and a range host of different industries. Um, and she successfully tackled commercial challenges across a diverse range of those industries. If you're not exhausted already, just, just listening to that list, um, 
then uh, I'm sure you will be when we finish tonight's presentation. We're delighted that Deborah's offered to share this rich experience here with us tonight. Um, and Deborah, as a token of our appreciation, we are going to be presenting you with this gift. We can show it to camera. It is a, a, a beautiful, really beautiful and quite heavy um, handmade glass paperweight, which has been made for us, um, especially for you, for one of our applied art graduates, um, Pam Martin. Um, Pam graduated in 2018 and has continued her glass making journey by establishing her own business. So if any of our um, uh, guests this evening are, are interested, you can explore Pam's collection for yourselves at pammartinglass.co.uk. Um, so, Deborah, without any further ado, I would like to hand over to you now and uh, we look forward to, to hearing about your fantastic journey. Deborah. Hi everybody. Good evening. Can you see me? Okay. Absolutely. We can see you. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And apologies, a bit of duplication here. I've got um, trying to uh, never quite get used to doing everything working at home, but I'm uh, I've got a spare device ready in case my iPad battery dies out. So hope it doesn't get too annoying. But I'm going to put that out of the way for now. But yeah, firstly, thank you very much, and good evening, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to talk to you this evening. Um, at UCM annual lecture and actually it's a good job we are on on zoom and not face to face as I'm actually uh, in isolation at the moment with COVID so uh, free tomorrow so looking forward to that um, but also um, yeah just uh, I, I, I had intended to uh, maybe be a bit looser with the presentation in terms of fluidity but I am going to read it a little bit more verbatim just so I make sure that I do cover all the points because you know, having COVID, if anybody has had it, will realise, will know that it's not, not pleasant. Um, so anyway, let me begin. My name is Deb Darlington. Thank you for the brilliant introduction. I am the Brand Marketing and Communications Director for the Cooperative Bank, a role which I absolutely love, feel very, very proud to hold. And I get to lead a fantastic team of 60 marketeers, so I certainly don't do it alone. And we've worked, many of us, together for a long, long time. They're all very passionate about delivering the right outcomes, not only for our brand, but for our wonderfully loyal customers, who we'll talk to you about a little bit later. Um, as I was reflecting on this presentation, it did make me draw on a few parallels in my own journey with that of the bank, uh, whether through my studies, my personal life, my career. Uh, it's certainly been an adventure, bumpy at times, never plain sailing, but I can say it's been truly exciting, very rewarding, and always with a sense of purpose. Um, I've worked in marketing now for over 20 years, starting my career a little later than I think my parents had expected. After finishing my degree in business and marketing, I headed off traveling and spent the next four and a half years in Asia, um, predominantly in India and Nepal, which to be honest, I wouldn't have changed for anything. And I think the life skills I learned doing that were actually irreplaceable. And that shouldn't have been a surprise, to be honest. After deferring my degree post A-levels, I went on to work in Greece. I was passionate about working abroad, and I did that for, again, longer than I anticipated and went back year after year to do that. Um, but um, it's so, you know, I think it is fair to say that I do still actually love an adventure and the freedom that that allows. Um, but as we know, life's expensive, so I did need to come back and get a, a real job, um, in, according to my parents. It had always actually been my intention to be a lecturer uh, and to lecture in marketing when I'd finished uh, my studies. Um, when it dawned on me, actually, one day as I was thinking, actually, I could end up teaching people who know far more than me as a marketing lecturer. So I actually picked up with an old lecturer of mine who said that probably the best plan was to get some industry experience, some postgrad qualifications, um, if I was intent on lecturing. And clearly it was sound advice because by now I was a bit of a hippie, to be honest, who'd been off grid for a few years. So it certainly was the right thing to do and it set me on the right path. So that's what I did. On my return home to Manchester, I secured marketing roles, working in, as you mentioned, mail order, fashion and retail, which I loved. And I became a specialist in advertising, media, brand strategy and marketing communications. I obtained my IDM, my postgrad qualifications and my master's. And I did actually end up becoming and getting the opportunity to do lecturing at Salford University, which I did for a couple of years in the evenings on the master's programme. Um, and I really do genuinely thank that lecturer for, the, for his advice, because it was certainly the right thing to do. For those of you who know Manchester, it is or was the hub for brands specialising in direct marketing in the time, including mail order and financial services. And of course, it's the home for the cooperative movement which if you are from the Northwest, uh, then the co-op is actually part of your DNA. It's just part of what you grow up with. 
and as a Manchester born marketer, offers of roles to join the cooperative bank were actually not unfamiliar. It was somebody, you know, you're often getting calls from recruitment agencies to come and work at the bank. Um, but to be honest, I didn't necessarily have much of a draw to financial services. Uh, and I actually kind of resisted that for quite some time. I actually thought it was a little bit of lazy marketing um, doing financial services, but I was obviously I've learned through experience. I was very, very wrong about that. It was after taking a role in financial services with Britannia Building Society to lead their marketing and advertising that the news broke. Britannia were merging with the cooperative bank and that was 12 years ago and the rest is history. I wasn't unfamiliar with the cooperative bank. Interestingly, for me, undergrad dissertation, I'd studied the bank along with a body shop to understand if brands were genuinely trying to make a positive difference in their ethical endeavours or was it actually a marketing ploy? Incidentally, they both came out pretty authentic and they are still fighting their causes nearly 30 years later, although both not without their troubles and challenges, whether in terms of credibility, financial stability and others quick to take their place. But it's how we respond to these challenges as marketeers that I think makes our industry so interesting, especially those who work on brands who want to stand for something and put their head above the parapet as those are easier to take a shot out and call out when things go wrong, which I'll come on to later from any experience of Cooperative Bank's story. But like all of us who work in marketing, we are passionate about the brands we work for. And as guardians of those brands, our job is to lead them in a little bit of a better position than when we found them. And I ensure that is my mantra every day when I go to work, albeit some days that is a little bit tougher than others. But I, I genuinely feel privileged to work uh, of the cooperative bank and I genuinely uh, have, adored, have loved working on some of the brands that I have over the years but I think it's fair to say not many have got under my skin quite as much as the co-op bank. My role at the bank allows me to put all my marketing skills and interest in listening to, to uh, the CIM uh, ladies talking about the disciplines and, and the components of, of the marketing program. And we genuinely do put those into play every single day. We exercise our discipline in what we do and what my team do. And I can speak for many marketers that the joy of our profession is that really no two days are ever the same and the speed of change is thrilling and it's how well you respond to that and keep up with that that will, will stand you in good stead. And over, the ta over time, the remit of my role has grown significantly as brand and marketing has become the heartbeat of our business. So I also lead now on culture, inclusion and diversity, sustainability, ESG and reputation, reputational management. And it's fair to say I'm still learning in this role every single day and every day is faced with new challenges, which I love. But I think it's interesting to think a little bit about the category of banking as well as a marketeer, because when we think about banking, we don't often think of it as being at the cutting edge of innovation. Certainly not the more established brands, most of whom have complex legacy systems to work within and infrastructures that make it difficult to shift course quickly. It's highly regulated and with limited flexibility and the risk of hefty fines, most banks take a risk averse approach to the decisions that they make. However, it's fair to say we are seeing new entrants come into the market who seem to be able to leapfrog some of those complexities and those legacy issues that bigger banks face, whether through improved technology, better use of data and increased innovation. This can only be a good thing for the category and for customers. So it's something that we're certainly embracing, albeit harder for some of our, some of us, including the property bank, to, to move as quick. But it's certainly great that the industry is moving at pace. In the main, banking is commoditized. It's generally a low interest category for consumers. I think people, when we've done research previously, you know, many customers say, I just want it to work. It's fine that it's boring. And it's, it's steeped in inertia with our bank accounts so intrinsically linked into making our lives just work and not many of us want to think about or have the time to think about picking it or moving bank. But if customers do do, it's generally down to push factors such as poor experience, broken services being let down by that provider or the pull of switch incentives, linked offers and of course improved digital capability. So in a pretty homogenous sector, it's incredibly, incredibly important that banks find ways to differentiate from one another, trying to create an emotional connection with consumers beyond just the rational. And some brands spend hundreds of millions a year on advertising to do this, telling us how they're here to help us, the for the journey and the by our side. For the cooperative bank, that distinction is our ethical approach to banking. 
but this isn't and can't ever be a veneer. Customers tell us our ethics cannot be at the expense of good banking. It's not an either or, it's an and. We have to deliver the basics well or else ethics loses relevance. And as the world moves to question more and more the brands we consume and interact with and looks beneath the surface of those brands, they want to know what banks are doing with their money. Who are they investing in? What activities are they investing in? And do they or do they not conflict with what they believe is right and wrong? But sadly, in many cases, the answer is yes, they do. So today I'm thrilled to be talking to you about how we as marketeers have been front and centre uh, in the cooperative bank's turnaround journey after what has been a tumultuous few years. We learnt the hard way, but now we are seeing some positive shoots and the narrative of the brand is changing from defensive, reactive and crisis management to being bolder and more positive as we return to profit and lead again on ethical campaigning. So we can move to the next slide. I just wanted to give you a little bit of context about the Cooperative Bank. So we're a mid-sized bank based in the UK, currently number 12 in terms of scale, with the likes of Barclays, HSBC, Lloyds and RBS obviously much bigger than us. We've got 3.2 million customers across four brands. The Cooperative, Smile, interestingly the first internet bank that launched in the UK, Platform, which is our mortgage intermediary brand, and Britannia, a legacy brand from the merger that I referenced earlier. We have 2,800 colleagues, amazing colleagues, very loyal, but we have a limited branch footprint of about 50 branches, but spread across the UK. We have a relatively very low, actually, share of voice in terms of media compared to our competitors, usually around about two, between two and three percent. But the cooperative bank is both a retail bank for personal customers and a business bank with a particular strength in banking uh, SMEs, those with a turnover of around a million pounds. Though we do bank larger scale businesses, our target market is not corporate banking. We're also the leading bank of choice for charities, cooperatives, social enterprises, uh, for which we're very proud of. And those are key to, to making sure that we're delivering against our cooperative heritage. The bank was formed 150 years ago next year, born from the cooperative movement that started in Rochdale back in 1872. And we're based in Manchester and extremely proud of our northern roots. Next slide, please. Back in 1872, the Cooperative Bank was established with a really clear purpose, pioneering a different way of banking then as it still is now today. We created banking services that were unavailable anywhere else at the same time, and at the same time improve the conditions for the majority, not just the elite. We've stayed true to this purpose of making a positive difference to the lives of our customers and communities through these 150 years. Albeit we famously veered off course back in 2013, which I'll talk about more soon. And today we pioneer, pioneer by being the UK only customer-led bank with a customer-led ethical policy, which still distinguishes us today. Next slide, please. Just wanted to call out a few examples of some of the key things that we achieved over our the, the most recent years since the launch of the ethical policy. And in 74, we were the first UK bank to introduce free, free banking for all accounts and credit. And we still offer free banking for our charity customers. In 92, we introduced, as I said, our customer-led ethical policy, which was a breaking initiative, which today, since 1992, nearly 400,000 customers have helped shape the day-to-day -day and future policies of the bank. It's something we're incredibly proud of. And it's the reason why thousands of customers bank with us today and trusting their money to an organisation that recognises the social, economic and environmental impacts of its activity and ensures their money is not used in ways that conflict with their belief. Then in 2007, we're the first bank to go beyond carbon neutral, neutral offsetting more carbon than we were producing. Next slide, please. So what do I really mean by purpose and why is it so important for a business like ours? Well, a brand's purpose should be the reason the brand, brand exists beyond just that of making money. Next slide. A purpose should inspire your customers, your employees and your investors and be a driver of your business, its products, its services and its innovation. Next slide. Purpose gives consumers a reason to choose your brand in competitive markets when most of the things are equal. A good example of a really strong brand purpose, and just bringing a little bit of the outside in, not just only looking at the cooperative bank, 
is Tesla to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. At the core of Tesla's brand is innovation. They're pushing forward the possibility of what an electric car and transportation could look like in the future. The goal to drive the world with sustainable energy has completely changed the automotive industry. It's inspiring and it's engaging. Another, and one that's close to my heart, would be Dove, which is focused on giving women their self-esteem back, helping women develop a positive relationship with the way they look. Way back in 2004, the brand made its mark with its Real Beauty campaign, featuring untouched photography of women, not models, chosen to reflect the diversity of the population at large. The campaign went on to inspire many other brands to follow suit, but Dove wanted to do more. Their research shows that most women do not feel represented in, by the media in advertising, and that lack of representation has a real impact on confidence. So to address this last year, Dove partnered with Getty Images and the creator Girl Gaze to build a photo library that goes far beyond the traditional stereotypes of beauty. Known as Project Shows, the library now has more than 11,000 images of individuals who identify as female and non-binary available for media and advertisers to use in their campaigns. To date, just less than 3,000 companies have licensed these images from their collection, none of which is staged or touched up. Next slide, please. Amazon, on the other hand, historically has not had a very clear and authentic purpose. Its mission, which is to offer our customers the lowest possible prices, the best available selection and the utmost convenience is focused, it's clear. And until recently, I guess this hugely successful global brand would argue with no real competition, it didn't need to focus on why consumers should buy from them rather than others. It appears that this is now only just waking to the, um, waking up to, to the need for a purpose and has started talking about empowering businesses and content creators to maximize their success. Next slide, please. In the late 90s, in the late 90s, the bank's marketing team were very aware of the power of a compelling purpose. Initial customer research into whether having stronger ethical credentials would matter to new customers, students, and other groups didn't necessarily identify a compelling case. However, the team realized you know, the fame, many famous quotes that sometimes customers don't always know what they really want until they have it. So they actually pushed ahead and our ethical policy was born. This then led to them investigating the lack of transparency and financial understanding of what happens to consumers' banked money and to the identification of sectors their customers did not want their money used to fund. And not only put a spotlight on the supply chain to show how it would work ethically, but also then use the profits gained to work with NGOs to campaign for change in these areas. This became even more powerful when the team then decided to focus in on very real issues that were happening at that time. The Arms, Iraq, uh, Arms to Iraq inquiry looked specifically at this issue of where the money supply chain was coming from and going to. The night before the Scott inquiry, which was looking into the Arms to Iraq scandal, was published, creating a global news story. The bank's marketing team was sat on a set of full page print ads to go live in the nationals, pointing out their stance on high street banks funding to the arms sector. Next slide, please. And doing this the right thing took courage. That really began a decade of campaigning for the bank that made real change in the world. And it all came from being able to connect the bank's purpose with a cultural moment that really mattered. The bank performed well winning when parts of the finance sector were in crisis, using our purpose and our point of difference in competitive markets where consumers had very little trust. People were switching to us because of our purpose, because we had all our ducks in a row. We had higher market share than we had our share of voice. Switching in volumes were higher than ever. People were just moving their bank accounts to us. Mortgage incomes were driving significant profit. We had a compelling membership proposition that was based on a dividend and ethical banking movements were becoming the mainstream. They were starting to become into the vernacular that, pe vernacular that people were interested in hearing about. Next slide, please. But all too often, a brand's purpose is just a veneer. And in today's world, consumers and workers have more power than ever before to name and shame those brands who play at purpose. 
Social media and online platforms have given every one of us a voice, allowing consumers to say what they expect and then expect their brand and brands to respond. Each generation becomes more socially and environmentally aware and demands change. They have a voice and they're able to question the authenticity of brands and will shame those that are not true to their purpose. We've all seen lots of examples of walk washing with brands supporting causes that, that have little to do with their daily business. The more like a CSR bolt on made public, by, ra, made public rather than an acknowledgement of the purpose of the business itself. This shallow brand deep approach survives only as long as it's unrecognized with consumers quick to call out brands that let them down. Some of you may remember back in 19, Lacoste, the clothing and footwear brand, announced it was going to swap its trademark crocodile logo for 10 limited edition polo shirts featuring different endangered species. It was only when it was pointed out by some of its customers and the consumer market that, that a lot of the company was offering gloves made from deer leather and cow leather handbags online, and it was called out. Next slide, please. So coupled with critically the criticality of living your brand purpose, not just saying it, is the need for a solid business plan and a sound functional go-to market strategy, all of which the bank was doing exceptionally well. Next slide, please. But then in 2013, we broke all the golden rules that I've just spoken about and we were about to pay the price. Next slide, please. In February, 2013, the first story emerges in the FT of a billion pound black hole in our finances. Then in the March, the group results reported a 600 million pound loss. By May, Moody downgrades the bank, meaning it felt the bank was a higher risk and less financially secure. In June, the bank announced a rescue plan, announced to fill the one and a half billion black hole, and our then chairman for Paul Flowers was replaced. There was an official review initiated into the bank's failings. To add salt to the wound, in the November of the same year, the Mail on Sunday published a video of Paul Flowers, our ex-chairman, buying illegal drugs. In January 14, there was a series of investigations kicked off into the failures of the bank by the FCA. By April 14, the group reveals losses of two and a half billion, the most disastrous year in its 150 year history. And in May, Paul Flowers pleads guilty to drugs charges. By the end of the year, the bank had failed the Bank of England's stress test, which ensured the bank is resilient and has enough capital to withstand extreme shocks. We didn't. We no longer had a solid business plan with massive holes found in our balance sheet. We no longer had a sound functional strategy. We had to raise capital, so we separated from the cooperative group and had a lot of senior executives and management leave, which severely destabilised our business and all of our employees. And then the flower scandal, a local politician, Methodist minister and a non-exec chairman at the time of our bank, filmed buying drugs and allegedly communicating with rent boys using his court bank email account. This led to a crisis. Next slide, please. Customers have put their trust in us and we had broken that trust. We started to hemorrhage customers. For every one that joined, 20 were leaving. People were questioning our purpose, our ethics. The long-term stability of the bank was in question. It unsettled staff and we were easy fodder for the press. Next slide, please. So it was clear we needed to act and to start taking action. We went back to our purpose and we restated our commitment to ethics, embedding our values and ethics policy into our articles of association, which means that the bank and its employees are legally bound to run the company according to the published values and ethics policy. We introduced our values and ethics committee, which provides oversight and holds the bank to account on all ethical matters with board members and non-exec directors. We repositioned the brand, ensuring that our ethics were at the core and then get our message out there. And we made the bold decision to invest in advertising to shift the paradigm of the brand and ran our biggest ever customer poll to inform our new refreshed ethical policy making sure that we were focusing on the issues that really mattered to our customers. Next slide, please. But there were still lots of doubters. The Save Our Bank campaign was established by a group of vehemently loyal customers who were trying to press for the eventual return of the bank to majority cooperative ownership. The press were cynical. We further refreshed our strategy, setting the direction for the bank, 
led by our ethical purpose, and then we focused on improving our banking basics. We improved our digital offering, removed legacy systems which were costly in delivering poor customer experience. Led by our purpose, we continue to push forward. In June 15, we achieved the living wage accreditation to demonstrate commitments set out in our policy. In July, we issued our first independent values and ethics annual report, making a new era on how the bank reports on its policy. In October, we announced our cooperatives partnership supporting the movement and cooperative businesses in the UK. And then in December, we launched our first financial abuse campaign with Refuge. The bank's return to its heritage for campaigning on issues that matter to our customers and influence changes in its policy was starting to happen again. But we had to make some really tough decisions in order to try and balance the books. Reducing our branch footprint and making headcount reductions. Due to our financial position, we had to hold higher levels of capital, which hindered our ability to invest in the bank's turnaround in the way we maybe would have wanted to. But we started to stem customer attrition. But the economy as a whole was tough and this hindered our ability to grow. Our cost income ratio was still way too high and we were still being slated by the press. How could you be a cooperative with ethics at your heart when you're owned by hedge funds? Our limited finances and our financial structure meant we couldn't invest in many areas of the business that clearly needed improving. There were lots of challenges and we didn't always get it right. With wrong priorities chosen sometimes, failed project delivery, all of this made us a concern for the banking regulator and they clearly didn't want to end up in a position with another bank that needed bailing out, and nor did we. Next slide, please. So we had to continue to really try and build trust and rebuild trust. And it's taken years and years to consistently imbue our point of difference and to be a beacon of ethics with limited budgets and obviously to start to rebuild uh, that belief back in our brand. We have relentlessly reinforced our point of difference as the UK's only UK bank with a customer-led ethical policy by being ethical and focusing on the issues that matter most to our customers. Staying true to our cooperative roots, we've continued to support the cooperative movement via our work with The Hive, an enterprise hub for cooperatives. We're still beyond carbon neutral and we send zero waste to landfill. We campaign still alongside Amnesty International to fight for human rights both in the UK and abroad and we put pressure on governments to act and to fight for the release of political prisoners and we engage our customers to do the same with big campaigns that, that support just that. We also fund Amnesty's Rise Up programme which is empowering, training and upskilling the next generation of amazing campaigners and we've continued to work with Refuge to challenge economic abuse which is one of the major Finances are one of the major contributors to domestic violence or certainly hindering um, victims being able to leave abusive relationships. And we actually put pressure and work with other banks to do the same, to look at how we could change policy in, in government. Again, continuing to give people a voice. But the big part of our policy is that we only bank those businesses whose practices do not conflict with our ethics. We screen every business application that comes into the bank against our policy. As a result, since the policy launched 30 years ago next year, we've turned down over a billion pounds of business on the grounds of violations of human rights, climate change. Interestingly, for many years, we have had zero tolerance to the extraction of fossil fuels, irresponsible marketing, tax avoidance, and animal welfare, to name but a few. And we were getting there, and things were starting to really make a change. Next slide, please. And then COVID turned the world upside down. The pandemic has had a massive impact on all of our lives and our finances and has exacerbated the divide between the haves and the have-nots. Next slide, please. The, but the pandemic has fueled our appetite for ethical brands. A poll conducted by a think tank research agency called Britain Thinks, who I work very closely with, and actually advise the government on policy and consumer trends, highlights the same. National priorities emerging out of COVID echo our own cooperative values, fairness, wealth distribution, and generosity. First and foremost, we want a fairer value-centric distribution of wealth. We want kinder, more, a kinder, more equal society, and we don't want to go back to life the way it was. As we've said many times, this is a reset moment. 
The UK's ethical products and services market doubled over the 10 year period from 2008 to 18, reaching a total value of over 41 billion pounds. And the events of 2020 and beyond have only fueled this appetite further, with 45% of consumers saying they're making more sustainable choices when shopping and will continue to do so, according to Accenture. Next slide, please. And through the pandemic, we've seen a real new form of kindness in Muscle Emerge, the kindness, kind of kindness that gets results. Whether it's the fact that more than half a million people signed up to be NHS volunteers, surpassing the quarter of a million target, or the primary school teacher, Zane Powellus, who walks five miles every day to deliver school lunches to disadvantaged children, or neighbours offering to help each other with prescriptions and groceries, the pandemic has fueled our love of doing the right thing, being community minded, looking out for each other and bringing humanity back to the fore. Next slide, please. And our sense of what we stand for has become even more extreme with people being most empathetic to hyper -local, local and hyper global causes. From the research that we've done, we've seen that consumers and our customers are really passionate to support local businesses as they have done through the pandemic, helping them to survive and helping local food banks right the way through to worldwide marches campaigning for the world to take climate change seriously or global, the global Black Lives Matter movement. The causes that have suffered in 2021 sit in between this hyper-local and hyper-global. They're in our news cycle, but they're not necessarily in our conscience. Next slide. But led by our purpose, we're continuing to push forward. In fact, our purpose has become more important than ever during the pandemic. We are the original ethical bank and our purpose now underpins everything we do as it has done in the past. It's not just an add-on to capitalise on the swell of public opinion and our commitment to our purpose is paying off again. We've seen really good signs in terms of our brand health. We're number one for ethical perception of non-customers and customers. And despite low levels of brand awareness, not due to having limited marketing budgets, we are seeing brand consideration increase significantly, which is testament to the making sure or what we believe is evidence that our message is resonating and we're talking to the right people for whom it appeals, for whom an ethical bank appeals. Next slide, please. And positivity continues to create a swell of good news. For many years working with the ethical policy, we hadn't necessarily found the framework to govern and to manage how we, what we do and how we measure and add, demonstrate value to investors of our ethical positioning. And ESG gives us that. And we have actually, by, uh, by the ratings agency, Sustainalytics, be, um, we are rated the UK's number one high street bank for ESG, which is incredible and something we're incredibly proud of. But what this leads to is more ethically minded investors wanting their share in the bank so we can eventually reduce our reliance on hedge funds who will clearly want a quicker return for riskier investments. This, too, gives us stability and a real positive uh, demonstration and green shoots for the future. Next slide, please. And our brand purpose is now leading the bank and underpinning what we do, helping us to develop ethical products like our current account that enables uh, our customers to earn rewards to, to give to the charities that matter to them. But more importantly, and recently, it's really informed how we've helped our customers and communities through the pandemic. So we knew we had to lead from the front when, when these very people were struggling and these people who've been so loyal to us and our brand. First, we were the first to offer 500 pound interest-free overdrafts and we supported 350,000 of our customers with that. 10% of our mortgage book were given payment holidays. One of the first banks to remove overdraft fees and charges for SME lending facilities. We've really, really stretched out to support cooperative businesses because it's a model not many other banks truly understand. So with the cooperatives that were banking with other brands, they were really struggling to access lending to see them through the pandemic, putting their businesses and their employees' roles at risk. We donated headsets to GPs and Trussell Trust food banks. And we're dri driven by a desire to collectively respond. All our colleagues donate thousands of items to create cooperative care packages for our own NHS customers. Even still, we're developing content and a business exchange hub to really help businesses get through the, the, the outpouring of what are the impacts of the pandemic, whether they're our customers or not. 
this is just about information sharing and being helpful. Next slide, please. We're growing our market share, and this year we managed to turn the business around to make a profit, which has been the first time in 10 years. And that's really important. In order to operate sustainably, we need to make profit, but we're profit driven for a purpose. And as our profits grow, so does our ability to do good and to make a difference. Next slide, please. But we can't be complacent. Ethics is not niche. It's fast becoming the norm. Competitors are moving in this space. And of course, the more brands that do good, the better for all of us. But for those consumers who genuinely want to make a sustainable choice, it is going to become more difficult to know which brands are authentic, as there is a lot of greenwashing. So buyers need to be demanding of those they choose to do business with and look under the surface of what brands are saying. As each generation becomes more socially and environmentally aware, then demand for change will constantly grow, which is a fantastic thing. In fact, a recent study, next slide please, which was a survey published by the Edelman Trust, highlights that 86% of consumers across 27 developed countries across the world now expect CEOs to lead on societal issues, filling the void of government. With our purpose of pioneering banking that makes a positive difference to the lives of the community, our customers and communities, we cannot and won't stand still. We need to continue to set the bar as we have just recently completed our sixth customer poll that will guide the next chapter for the bank. Leveraging our unique heritage and positioning. And last week we presented the CE bill to number 10 Downing Street, working with key scientists to drive the government to do more as we move to and beyond COP26. So I'm just gonna leave, I referenced the body shop at the start of my presentation. So I wanted to leave you with a quote from the late Anita Roddick of the body shop, who we have worked with very closely in the past. She said, consumers have not been told effectively enough that they have huge power and purchasing and shopping involves a moral choice. To me, this rings as true today as it did when we started out. I'm standing here today with 50,000 responses to our latest ethical policy survey still the largest of its type in the UK. Those 50,000 customers have taken the time to complete this survey and know the power that they have in having a say. And I'm proud and excited to start looking at what they're telling us and what changes me and my team and the bank will make in the future as a result. So thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was genuinely very inspirational and um, the video was incredibly moving. Um, so thank you very much indeed. I'm sure everybody here this evening has learned a lot. Um, can't thank you enough for your time and for the, um, the humble way in which you presented what is actually quite a, um, a staggering portfolio of, of, of achievements over your career. And also what an amazing um, experience working with the Co cooperative bank it's 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 genuinely very eye-opening and very inspirational um, i'm going to hand over now to my colleagues uh haria Zerchich and um emma edwards who are here this evening uh, representing our fantastic marketing lecturing team and they are going to take over the q a so do i have emma and haria here we do. Hi, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we're going to go through some questions, um, Deborah, if that's OK. Yeah, fine. Brilliant. Thank you, Deborah. So um, first of all, we have a comment and a question from Dr. Roy Broad, and uh, he states, thanks for a fascinating and such an open presentation quite a case study and his question is we have less dependence and opportunity for face-to-face -face banking private banking services are becoming just another household commodity so how do you see the co-op bank meeting this challenge and is a stronger ethical message enough i think it's a really good question and i think this comes back to the point we talked about uh, where our customers tell us that you know ethics isn't just about what you do at the side, it's intrinsically linked to how you work and interact as a bank. I think in terms of digital offering and remote banking, it is absolutely uh, at the fore and that's only been accelerated through the pandemic. Um, but I think, you know, the cost to serve and innovation that's needed 
Um, it is taking a lot of investment from brands. And as I mentioned, we've seen a lot of new entrants stepping in and really doing a brilliant job in that space. But I think banks will catch up. I think we will see that many other banks, uh, small or mid-sized banks, uh, come together. I do think there will be more of a consolidation of banking because there, will have, there has to be a change. As I say, many of the infrastructures that exist within banks can't respond as quickly as they'd like. Um, but I do think, I, I, so no, I suppose in answer to your question, do I think ethics is, is enough? No, but I don't think banks that haven't got a purpose or haven't got a point of view and, and are setting out to do good will fail in time as consumers generally more and more want to make sure that what they're doing is not having a negative impact on the world. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we have another question here from one of our students. Um, how do you measure the return on investment of marketing within a, within a business? Um, well, that's an age old question. And what's interesting <laughs> is uh, working in a bank where you clearly are trying to convince many rational minded banking CFOs uh, on the importance of, of marketing uh, to invest. And, and we do have to prove our case. So we do it in a number of ways. Clearly, there's a more performance marketing aspect to the role, which is very clear where you can show effects, you know, where you, you, you work in basically through um, through a sales funnel. And we still work to that model, um, looking through building from consideration right down through to purchase and, 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 and how that works and the conversions. Um, but actually, what we do also understand is we uh, we manage measure brand health. So we have a CEO bank scorecard. Uh, which has um, quadrants of the clear metrics that the bank needs to achieve across a number of measures and brand is on there. So it, it absolutely is first and foremost in terms of uh, where, what is our ethical perception? Are we still leading the category? Because, you know, once if you, um, if we get that, if our lead position gets usurped, then that is a real concern to us. And also how we are, uh, how our ethics are resonating with our customers. Are we doing what we said and what they expect of us? So that's on our scorecard. That's linked to executive pay. That's linked to colleagues bonuses. That's linked to uh, the performance of the bank overall. But what we also do is we look at trends and we look at uh, where we see uplifts across sales. The thing with banking is you don't necessarily advertise a specific product and it sells instantly it's more about getting getting into that consideration and that mindset of consumers for whom an ethical bank appeals um so some of the return does take time so if we invest in brand one year we may not see the true return of that for some time albeit dependent on the products that we also promote um so so it's, it's multifaceted we can absolutely measure effectiveness some forms of uh, uh measurement are easier or quicker than others but it's fundamental because that's how we build our business case to secure additional and increase funding for, for every year of we go right through the budgeting rounds. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much. Um, and another question from Claire Schofield. What advice do you have for us for staying true to a vision, even when the results are not evident straight away? So how do you remain resilient? <laughs> so good. <laughs> we certainly have to be resilient at the bank. Um, I think fundamentally, if you believe that what you stand for is genuine and is intrinsic to your business and organisation and, and has belief uh, from the top down, I think what can often happen is, you know, the belief of colleagues, particularly frontline colleagues who deal with um, customers day in, day out, are absolute advocates and passionate for our brand. When that's not necessarily been from the top down, then that's meant is as, as uh, certainly created a wobble within the bank uh, or a little bit of uncertainty. I think having belief, ensuring that what you stand for isn't some um, indulgent, um, inter internally focused passion and drive and, and purpose, that it has a market, that people do genuinely care about it. And you are responding to what your customers tell you is important to them. You know, there's a quote that says a brand for everyone is a brand for no one. And I think that's still really, really important. You don't have to appeal or be relevant to everybody, but you do have to appeal and be relevant and deliver for those who choose to, to do their business with you. Thank you. Um, so another question here from Lisa, um, a very inspirational talk. Thank you so much to everyone for this event. 
Um, Gen Z are making choices to work in ethical businesses and those which value employees. Do you think that this gives companies like yours an advantage on talent acquisition? I think there's lots of changes that are changing the market. I think the fact that the, you know, the acceleration of how we work now post pandemic is is incredible. Geographical divides have changed, you know, people's mobility and access to work, the digital adoption has increased massively. So there's so many things changing. But I do genuinely believe, you know, I obviously I, you know, interview a lot of people uh, over, over the time at the bank and generally people, or generally, genuinely, people want to join the bank because they know that it's a brand that they can relate to or that aligns to their own personal beliefs. And actually what we find is when they, when they start with us, they, they, they realise it's actually more than what they thought, that, that actually what we're trying to do is to really make a, a difference in banking. Um, but to answer to your question, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, Gen Z will, will, will naturally, and, 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 you know, all people want to make a difference. Mo I, I genuinely believe most people want to feel like what they're doing is having some positive impact on the world or in their, in their community and society. So, um, so yeah, I mean, um, always, always looking for new talent at the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so a follow on question from Claire. What marketing trends are you keeping an eye on that you might want to use in the future? I think the biggest, some of the big is, is the amount of, um, from a banking perspective, is, is just the innovation and technology. And one thing we are looking about at is how we can help customers not only by banking with us, but make ethical choices in their lives. So how we can use working with third parties. I think what is interesting and what many banks are doing now is recognising they can't do it all themselves. So having to partner with clear innovators or, or uh, smaller businesses that can really be flexible and introduce new technology. So for me, what trends we're looking at is how consumers' mindsets changing, how people want to make a difference, how people want to understand the impact that the that they have on society or on the environment or on, on, on things that matter to them. So looking at where we can help them to do that and where we can help demystify some of what happens around um, in, in terms of ethical choices and how we can help maybe, you know, we're talking with, um, interestingly, with um, some ministers around how we can almost create a stamp or to validate uh, organisations that have got some ethical, that have ethical credentials, because I do think it's going to be harder and harder for consumers to make really informed choices with so much noise out there. Um, and you only have to see now, you know, as we're moving and obviously we're realising the problems of, of, of the climate crisis, we're seeing the, the, you know, the disparity of wealth and how actually those that are less fortunate will, will naturally probably suffer much harder in terms of the uh, environmental impact and all what that means. And I think trying to help people navigate their way through that for me is something that will, will only, um, help brands so for me it's about empowering and information that are key trends of course on top of everything you would expect from a bank which is offering relevant products and services in a way that consumers want to want to interact with them and and you know without going into banking but the introduction you know of open banking is making the flow of data and transfer of knowledge and information so much more easier thank you so now we've got a question from our associate director sarah williams yeah, I'm, I'm going to take host privilege and just ask you a question, Deborah. Um, I, I wanted to go back to something that you said right at the beginning about um, the announcement over the weekends uh, about uh, taking over TSB. Um, TSB and their association with Lloyds has not always been considered ethical. Uh, what are the challenges do you think going to be in from a communications standpoint of managing that takeover? Well, first off, it is still a lot of... Um, it's still only new, so it's, we're certainly nowhere near on that. I think so. So the first point I think, in terms of if anyone has seen anything in the press over the weekend that broke, that what is, I suppose, 
powerful for our, my co uh, colleagues, our teams at the bank is that the bank is, is changing the narrative. You know, we have, we have been at the butt end of many stories for a long time, you know, and, and I don't want to say lazy journalism because journalists have a really tough job to do as well, but it's so easy to define the negative or when we, you know, we end on a line of Paul Flowers, et cetera, at the end of every single piece that's written about us. So to start to change that narrative feels actually very welcome. I think in terms of how we navigate that, in terms of where brands have come from, and you know, TSB did come from a really, really good place in a sound base and really entrenched in community banking and small business banking. So for us, I think if we if this does go anywhere, who knows? There'll be probably many, many more noises around different types of, of, of stories like this. Who knows? But I think it's about fundamentally recognizing that the brand and what differentiates us is what has put the bank, the corporate bank into this position today. And we'll need to work to make sure that we retain that. But it is a, it's complex. And we're finding out a lot about this as, as you are as well, as you're reading some of it. <laughs> thank you. Um, we've got another question here from Angela. Um, thank you so much for an inspiring presentation. Does the cooperative bank offer any kind of ethical financial literacy or education programs for children, young people and their families? We've interestingly, we are starting, um, we, we did, but when we were with the cooperative group, they actually have uh, academies, which are incredible things. So this is something we're now exploring. We do make sure we have content available um, and we need to do more of that, actually. But we have worked through our inclusion networks um, with uh, mentoring and apprenticeships and really working with programmes predominantly across the northwest, but in those real um, more disadvantaged areas. Um, you know, social inclusion and social mobility is something I'm really, really passionate about. And it's something we will definitely be focusing on. But yes, we do offer mentoring and we offer, um, as I say, we do um, apprenticeships is a huge part of our uh, programme of recruitment. OK, thank you. Um, you spoke about the ethical practices um, that are undertaken by the Co-op Bank and the challenge around greenwashing. So how does the Co-op brand avoid greenwashing uh, their activities? Well, we just make sure that our activities are driven by authenticity, credibility, evidence. Uh, you know, we we have an amazing organisation that's called, I referenced it, Save Our Bank, they were initially called, they're actually now, they're called the, the Customer Union for Ethical Banking, and it's a pressure group on the bank. When the bank separated from the group, there was a number of, of quite a few hundred or going on to a thousand customers who were absolutely passionate about uh, the bank getting back to its cooperative roots and not losing its ethical positioning. And they hold us to account consistently. So I meet with them quarterly. We go to their AGM where we get a real tough time actually sometimes from their members. And we make sure that what we are doing is, is continuously living true to our cooperative values, which we have to do as we've, we've put it into our articles of association. We have to evidence this. We also audit our uh, sustainability and values and ethics report to make sure that, you know, it's not us marking our home, own homework, that we're held to account on everything that we do. Um, and that we're learning and we look at um, how we can make things, do things better and, and bigger every time. Brilliant, thank you. Um, which marketing channels are the most successful for the bank? Well, it depends on what the objective is. Um, of course, you know, I think we, we have a very responsive customer base and, and a customer base that wants to hear more and more about our ethical positioning. So we have a programme of activity that does, do, that does that and a customer panel that we engage with on um, new types of marketing, new messaging, new ideas, product innovation. And, and so it's a great resource for us to be able to access. In terms of, I suppose, caught on a kind of cost per basis, then you'd say, you know, clearly your digital channels are very, very effective because you you pay for what you sell. So, you know, whether you work on a cost per click or your cost per sale basis, then, you know, you know you um, what kind of volume or what is your 
kind of tolerance in terms of um, spend and, and what you can accept as an, an acceptable cost. And we're working actually quite interestingly with our product colleagues on this, where we're taking it rather than always using a marketing cost to drive that, we're using it out of their PL. So we work, it's called a negative income basis. So basically they can trade it off against um, income on the PL and therefore because it's it's money spent to drive a sale. I personally still believe brand advertising done well is some of the most effective marketing. So if you have a really compelling message, you don't always have to spend the most amount of money. You know, as I said, we our share of voice is sometimes around about 2%, if that, um, compared to the likes of Halifax, you know, nationwide, Lloyds, uh, who are spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds a year on advertising to maintain their position. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes being one of the smaller challenger brands is an advantage because you can work be a be a bit smarter in terms of how you buy media so we can go out at quieter times so we increase and, and kind of inflate that share of voice so we have a bigger sense of scale we also see uh, much more innovative channels around you know the um in in terms of catch-up tv etc uh, and interestingly uh, through the pandemic we reintroduced uh, radio into our media mix because obviously as people were at home more well, media uh, radio actually massively increased in terms of uh, opportunities to hear and, 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 and people listening to commercial radio um, more so than tv which obviously really struggled in terms of new programming and staying appealing to to consumers so that really dried up and and advertising did um, it was very cheap actually but people really didn't want to be using it and i think everyone tired quite a bit of the kind of hand clapping um zoom call type ads that everyone was doing um so yeah i think you know there's there's a whole host of different media that still work really really effectively but in terms of broad reach or mass reach to get a message across if your if your challenge is to create brand awareness and ultimately consideration then you know still tv still does work now we're coming out the other end of the Mm -hmm. pandemic so i'd say it's definitely around what is the objective that you're trying to achieve and it's about how those interact and what is that integrated media approach that you adopt to depend depend on what that what that um business objective is Thank you. We've got one final question now, and it is, do you have, so you've got a broad portfolio of responsibilities. Do you have any advice for our students and our graduates about the strategies that you use to manage such a broad portfolio? I think just, you have to love it and enjoy it. Um, you know, I think as we work from home now and, and demands on, on everyone who works for organisations are greater. I don't think anybody's job is easier. It's it's busier and there's, there's people are doing more with less generally. But I think in terms of how you manage a broad breath is, is don't try and do everything on your own. You know, I have a fantastic team of marketers. And I know if you read anywhere and people say about recruiting or who you work with and, you know, always recruit or work with people who inspire you and motivate you and and work as a team you know my team many of us have worked together for a long long time and we intrinsically know how each other work and so we're there as a support for each other as well as trying to carry each other through uh, tough meetings or tough challenges um but but as a team we get through it together and we recognize that by doing that we uh, we're there to to work alongside one another um and i'm very proud of the team that we've built um but fundamentally it's about having a love and a passion for what you do i do think if you're not passionate about the brand that you work for then that does make your job a lot harder because you have to have that emotional i believe connection to what it is that you're trying to do to be able to drive the results and to really get under the skin of a brand Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I I just want to say thank you so much Um, again, Deborah. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, And I'm sure um, that our audience have have found that so useful. Um, I'm going to hand over, I think, now to Sarah just for the final remarks. 
Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much. And and yes, all, all that remains for me to do this evening is to thank everybody for coming and spending uh, the last uh, hour and 20 minutes or so with us listening to the fabulous Deborah Darlington. Thank you so much for joining us this evening um, for your wonderful insights into um, the working of, of, of Cooperative Bank. It sounds fascinating and exciting at the same time. And thank you once again to Rachel and Amy for joining us this evening and for your continued support. Our relationship with uh, the Chartered Institute of Marketing really is very important to us all here at Wolverhampton University. So thank you so much to everybody for taking part and for joining us here this evening. Thank you from the University of Wolverhampton and we hope to see you all in person next year.